He called me a gold digger and refused to build a life with me. Now I'm walking away for good. I'm 34F, breaking up with my boyfriend, 34M, because of a prenup I've been with my boyfriend for about two years. Everything is going well and we love each other. We've been discussing marriage and he mentioned he would not marry me without a prenup. We discussed this in detail and I did not like what he proposed. His family owns a lot of property, land, and has lots of savings. After marriage, he wants me to move into one of the houses his parents own. I told him I'm uncomfortable building a life and a family in a house I have no ownership in and he didn't understand. I told him I'd prefer to rent a place together or we can live temporarily in one of his parents' houses and look at property together but he refused. He said he liked the houses his parents and he already owned. He said he would not buy other property. He said he would not sell any of his property to buy one with me. He told me if I wanted to own property, I could save up money by living in one of these properties and invest in one myself. Problem is, he would be entitled to half if we divorced since my purchase would happen after marriage. He told me I could pay his parents' rent if I feel like I don't belong on the property. He told me I could buy half of the house we live in from his parents. Problem is, I don't like the houses that him or his parents own. They also have a lot of stuff, and I feel like there's no space for me. I want to look at houses, I want to pick the place I live in, and I want to do it with my partner. I've made this clear to him over and over, but he won't budge. He earns more than me, and he has more assets than me for sure. He made it clear he was afraid I was a gold digger, and he wanted to protect himself and his family's assets from me, which I can understand. This whole thing has made me feel very weird. This topic has come up before, and it has always made me feel very small. It makes me feel like all he cares about are his assets. It makes me feel like he wants me as long as I fit into the life he already built and doesn't care to build one with me. It makes me feel like a gold digger. He has enough money to retire right now and live comfortably. I don't. He basically told me that whatever money he earns now, he can spend, so he won't be investing in too much anymore. He expects our earnings and our savings after marriage to be split, which I feel off about. I'm sure this is normal for some people. I'm sure other people would be happy to be with someone who was well off. I am not. I want someone beside me building a life with me, not someone who has built a life with his parents and wants me as long as I behave and fits into his life, which is how he's been making me feel. So I'm leaving him. I welcome opinions on this. But yeah, it's been too long that this has made me feel off about our relationship. I'm protecting my peace and leaving him with all his houses and money. Tolger, BF and I are talking about marriage. Boyfriend and his family are well off. He wants me to live in a house I don't own and doesn't want to look at houses with me. Wants half of post prenup assets. So I'm leaving. Relevant comments OP adds context to the their relationship. No, he mentioned prenups very early and I would keep asking him about the details, but he would keep it very vague and assure me we would work it out when the time came. I never asked him about his assets, and I never actually knew how much assets his family had. The only things I knew were from some of his one-off comments about certain assets. If he mentioned this tenant or that tenant, or this thing they have to repair, etc. I had also initiated these conversations. He mentioned wanting to live with me and work towards marriage. I figured then that time had come. This is when I sat him down and asked him what he expected from me, what he wanted, and to clarify the conditions of any prenups he wanted to propose. He still tried to dodge my inquiry. It took so long for me to pull this information out of him. I guess I did wait two years, but marriage talks seemed like the right time to push him to discuss it. Update. So many things have happened. This is a bit of a rant, and I know I'm missing parts, but I'll try to cover the important bits. Before I start, here's some important context. I have a stable and rewarding career. And though I don't earn as much as him, I am very happy with what I can afford. My parents have always taught me that women should be independent, and I've taken that to heart. I live below my means, which has allowed me to put aside money for savings and investments. A lot of comments have mentioned that I should take the free rent and that it would somehow set me forward in life. But for me, giving up my sense of autonomy and control over my home, my safe space, is not worth the potential savings. I lived with my parents and saved aggressively until I was 30. So I am lucky enough to be in a position where I can comfortably afford rent or a mortgage by myself. Plus, he expected the living situation to be permanent. I would not move into a house owned by someone else just to save on rent. Would it be nice to save $2,000 a month? Sure, but most people pay rent, and I am not an exception. If I really wanted that, I could move back in with my parents. But again, autonomy is very important to me. Also, if he's this stubborn now, I don't see how this situation could be improved later after I already moved in. I could also counter the prenup and make it so all my accumulated assets stay mine, or put in a clause that I'll be compensated for any children we have, or put that I'd get alimony, or at least have a roof over my head in case we divorce. But for me, 
that feels overly transactional. It also gives me the vibes that I'm going to be living with a roommate who I sleep with and might have babies with, not a partner. I prefer to feel like we're in it together. He can keep what was his, but I want to build up what is ours. Also, if everything is completely split, it'll open up a new can of worms. How will our expenses be split if I'm working and he's just chilling? What happens when we have children? He has money saved for them, but will I get a say in how we spend that money? I know these can be worked out, but this is not the type of marriage I want. I can't predict everything that will happen, and I don't think I can capture it in a contract. And it's already been so heartbreaking for me. I don't want to go through more. Anyways, yada yada yada. I'll just say that it felt like I was being stripped of my autonomy, stonewalled, and treated like a hostile. Okay, on to updates. So I told him I needed to end this relationship. I appreciated and truly enjoyed my time with him, but our financial values and the preferred married lifestyle just don't match. It was a quick and easy conversation, Teef. I expected the breakup to be a bit of a process, not a one-and-done thing, since our lives overlap a lot. I'm also in contact with a lot of his family, so Ox, during this whole time, a lot of them got involved. Not super relevant to updates. Talk with his parents. Okay, I love his parents. I had a great relationship with them. I would go over to their house, we would have food, chat, watch TV. Sometimes I would go to the parties they host without my ex if he was busy. A few days after my talk with my ex, I went over to say goodbye. I didn't know if the prenup was family enforced or not, so I kept it very general and mainly focused on how the situation made me feel and what I was looking for in a relationship. His parents were shocked when I told them why I was leaving. I'm going to bullet point the rest. His parents really want grandbabies. However, my ex's younger brother and Syl do not want kids. They were so happy when I came into their lives and she found out I wanted kids. His parents had created their wealth together, with his dad being the major breadwinner for most of the relationship. His mom was shocked at what he was offering me, saying these aren't the values he was raised with. She'd been effectively retired since almost 15 years ago, and she said ex's dad never made her feel uncomfortable because of the difference in earning potential. They told me that they built their assets for themselves and their children. They said that includes whoever their children decided to share their lives with. They have many properties. However, they also have enough investments that they can live off of those. They told me their plan was to sign over a house of our choosing as a wedding gift or sell a house and give us cash so we could buy a house we both wanted. As they got older, they planned to evenly divide their properties between my ex and his brother since they wouldn't want to manage the properties anymore and live off investments. Ex's mom said she would have made sure my name was on my ex's portion especially since we were wanting kids. They mentioned investments will go directly into funds for grandkids after their passing. Maybe this is what my ex was referring to when he said his children would be set. Bit morbid, though. Ex's mom told me that the mother of her grandbobbies would be taken care of, and she wanted us to be on equal footing while raising a family. TBH, this conversation was kind of like a weight off my chest. I always loved his family and never felt excluded, but the prenup talks left me confused and hurt. What they said fit with what I knew from my ex and them before. I'd be lying if I said I didn't start imagining this life I'd talk to my ex again. I'll bullet point this too. Basically, he told me, his dad had joked before about how he hoped him and his brother would not find gold diggers, and that's where that comment came from. He felt responsibility to protect his parents' assets, since he didn't feel entitled to them. So by extension, I wasn't entitled either. In his culture, sons carry on the family line, so he felt he had to keep his assets in the family line, which I'm not part of. But any sons we had would be. Most of the assets he's worried about are under his parents' name, and he had never asked for their opinion on what to do. He just did what he thought he should be. He also said he isn't that well off, and that his assets shouldn't come between us. This is still confusing to me. Isn't this whole thing because he was well off? and wanted to hold on to what he had and not create a shared lifestyle. I think maybe he meant he didn't own much, and most things actually were under his parents' name. He felt he was punching above his weight with me, and was scared I would leave him. He was afraid I was with him because of his finances, since that was the only thing he had more of. Whereas he said, I am intelligent, hardworking, beautiful, blah blah. He was scared about moving forward with the relationship, but instead of communicating, he became defensive. To me, it seems like he said and did things because he was feeling deeply insecure. He had made a couple passing comments before about me being more beautiful than him or how I'm more hardworking etc. But I had always taken them as compliments, not self-deprecating comments towards himself. He's such a caring, funny, and intelligent person, just in a different way than me. Also, I know he's not as confident as he comes across, but I had no idea that his insecurities ran this deep. He also apologized over and over about how he didn't mean to make me feel like an outsider to him and his parents, 
and insisted that he wanted to share a life with me. He said his insecurities and fear got the best of him, and he didn't handle it well. He had taken advantage of my patience and lashed out because he felt inadequate and scared. It broke my heart because I think all this could have been avoided. We've been through this song and dance before many times where he would feel some sort of way, then act out as he's processing it. Until now, I always stay through it and we move on. But it's never gone on for so long. But I guess the issues we faced before were smaller compared to mapping out our whole lives. I've pushed him to seek individual counseling and we've attended couples counseling together. But I can't force him to sit and identify his emotions or employ the tools we were taught. The prenup conversation happened over a long period of time. He had so many chances to pump the brakes and reflect on what he was saying, and simply just tilled listen told to me. But he didn't. He then sat in front of me saying that everything he said before was not what he meant. He said he would be happy to take care of me and our future kids. We could buy a house together or rent if I wanted to. Because now he wasn't scared about creating a life together. Completely opposite to everything he had been saying. But how unsettling is it that he seemed so completely comfortable and confident in the hurtful words he previously said and was okay with placing me in a very unequal position in the relationship, despite me continuously trying to articulate what I wanted and how he was making me feel, he didn't even consider my side. Over months, I know I have a good deal with what his parents are offering and I know him and I get along super well, but I'm not marrying his parents. I can't have his mom with us during every argument or life decision we take. Thinking back, I can count on one hand where we've run into issues and he was able to address it without acting up. He's such a nice guy, but I can't be his garbage bin every time he needs to sort out his feelings. It's already worn me down. He's a grown man, he's intelligent and intuitive, He's had two years to learn how to communicate with me, and he's not. I honestly can't tell if what he said to me is genuine, or coming from his parents, or coming from a fear of losing me. I could give him the benefit of the doubt again and move forward with the relationship as I've done in the past, but I'm tired. I think this is a fixable problem, but I also have not seen any improvement since we started dating. If anything, this prolonged experience has made me feel it's gotten worse. I will not make the mistake of investing in a man because of what he could be instead of who he is. If the last few months are a testament to how he handles stressful situations, I can only take things as they are and assume they won't change. This whole thing has left me sour. I don't need too much, but I do expect to be treated with love and support, even during times of disagreement. I cannot just forget the feelings and words I felt and heard over the last couple of months. I can't just unhear and unknow that he is afraid I'm a gold digger. That was just one of many comments that really hurt me. I think life will have a lot more ups and downs, and I cannot imagine what kind of difficulties we will face if this is how we communicate, even after identifying it and working on it in therapy. For these reasons, I'm still choosing to walk away. Very diff from leaving because of a prenup, but it is leaving nonetheless. And to be, this hurts more. I know it will hurt for a while, but I pray I'll be avoiding heartache and complications in the future. Who knows? If it was meant to be, Maybe we'll find our way back. For now, I've told him and his family I need space and time. I know that it seems like I'm giving up a lot, but, oh see, there are things I can't put in a post. I actually wrote the above quite early. But I didn't post because it didn't feel like it was over. But now, after this time, I know it is. It's been tough. And it's only been a couple months, but I'm sure I made the right call. It's tough watching everyone coupled up and having children, but it is what it is. I'm proud of myself for leaving and I'm slowly healing. Thank you everyone for your comments and DMs. Sorry I couldn't get back to everyone, but I appreciate you all. Thank you for watching. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do so and hit the notification bell to stay updated with more shocking real-life stories happening around you. Their biological mother came back, and suddenly, I was no longer mom now. I'm stepping away from a family that no longer feels like mine. Me 30-year-old female has been married to my husband 34 for 6 years and he has twins, a boy and a girl. Both of them are 16 now. When we started dating got married we went to family therapy and I made it clear that I was not trying to be their mother or replace their mother. Their mother hasn't been in their life since they were about eight. Life had settled into a comfortable rhythm for me and my family. Six years of marriage blended seamlessly with my husband's twins. We'd navigated the complexities of step-parenting, finding our own unique groove in the family dynamic. They even started calling me mom when they were around 12. When their biological mother vanished from their lives eight years prior, I never imagined she would resurface, nor did I anticipate the whirlwind of emotions that would, would follow. Recently, their bio mother came back into their lives and they were really excited. Things were great for about six months and then they started to call me by my real name. That hurt, 
but it's what they chose to do and I never questioned it. Their excitement at reconnecting with their biological mother was palpable, radiating through the walls of our home. I watched them eagerly await her arrival, their anticipation tinged with a longing that I couldn't quite understand. For six months, everything seemed harmonious. They showered her with affection, catching up on lost time and building bridges that had been left in ruins for years. But with her return came a subtle shift, a fissure in the foundation of our family unit. Their once frequent use of the word mom to address me dwindled, replaced with the stark reality of my given name. Each time they uttered it, it felt like a tiny dagger piercing the carefully constructed facade of familial bonds. I grappled with the hurt, swallowing it down with a forced smile, unwilling to let them see the cracks forming within me. They had a right to reconnect with their biological mother. Yet, the ache of being relegated to my given name echoed in the hollow chambers of my heart. I never questioned their choice, never demanded an explanation for the sudden shift in our dynamic. Instead, I buried my pain. Recently, they've been getting very disrespectful. The twins, once the embodiment of innocence and joy, have become agents of chaos. It began subtly, like a whisper on the wind, barely perceptible but impossible to ignore. They chafed against the confines of our household rules, pushing back against the boundaries that had once kept our family unit intact. Curfew became a mere suggestion a trivial inconvenience to be disregarded at will. Their bedrooms transformed into veritable war zones, strewn with the detritus of their adolescent rebellion a silent protest against the order I had fought so hard to maintain. But it was their words that cut the deepest, each barb of venomous arrow aimed squarely at my heart. You're not our real mom, they spat, the words dripping with contempt. I recoiled at the accusation, the weight of their words crushing me beneath their burden. How could they not see the love I had poured into their lives, the sacrifices I had made in the name of family? They're talking back to me, stating that I'm not their real mom, that I'm the reason she left, which is not true. I didn't meet him until almost a year and a half after she left. That now that she's back, they don't need me anymore. Three weeks ago, there was a big blow up where my stepson called me a bitch. I felt the blood drain from my face, my heart pounding in my chest as I struggled to comprehend the magnitude of his betrayal. In that moment, all sense of reason fled. I snatched his phone from his trembling hands, my fingers trembling with a mixture of rage and told him to stay in his room until his dad came back. But instead, he ran out and went to his mom's. She came over and it was a big argument. She tried to hit me and I pushed her out of my house. My stepdaughter told me if I ever put my hands on her mom again, then she'd kick my ass. They both went to their mom's place. In the quiet aftermath of the storm that had torn through the fabric of our once happy home, the memories of happier days lingered like a bittersweet ache in my heart. I cast my mind back to those moments of joy, the simple pleasures that had bound us together as a family. I remember the laughter that had filled our home on lazy Saturday afternoons, the sound of their voices mingling with mine as we shared stories and dreams over bowls of melting ice cream. It was a ritual, our own little tradition born out of love and shared experiences. We would gather around the kitchen table, our faces sticky with sweet indulgence, as we savored each creamy spoonful. The taste of chocolate and vanilla a comforting reminder of the bond that held us together. And then there were the adventures we had shared, the memories we had made on family vacations to Disney World. I can still feel the warmth of their small hands clasped in mine as we navigated the crowded streets their eyes wide with wonder at the magic that surrounded us. We would spend hours exploring every nook and cranny of the theme park, their laughter ringing out like music in the air as we rode roller coasters and met our favorite characters. But now, in the aftermath of the storm, those happy days felt like a distant memory, a faded photograph tucked away in the recesses of my mind. The joy that had once filled our home had been replaced by a hollow emptiness, a numb detachment that left me feeling adrift in a sea of uncertainty. Gone were the days of chauffeuring them to their various sports and activities, replaced instead by a sense of resignation that weighed heavily upon my shoulders. I would sit in the driver's seat of the car, the radio playing softly in the background, as I waited for them to emerge from the terror's immersion. But they never came, their absence a stark reminder of the distance that now separated us. And so, with a heavy heart and weary soul, I made the decision to step back, to allow their mother to take on the responsibilities that I had once shouldered alone. I would no longer wake them up for school or ferry them to their extracurricular activities instead, leaving them to navigate the complexities of their daily lives without my guiding hand. It was a painful decision, one born out of necessity rather than choice. But in the end, I knew that it was the only way forward, a small step towards reclaiming my own sense of self amidst the chaos that threatened to consume us all. And as I watched them disappear into the distance, their figures fading into the horizon like ghosts in the mist, I knew that it was time to forge a new path forward, one that would lead me back to myself. And then came the bombshell, 
a revelation that shattered the fragile peace that had settled over our fractured family. We were supposed to go to Disney World for their spring break this week, but I canceled everything. I told them and my husband and I guess they thought I was bluffing. We were supposed to leave Thursday night, and when I didn't start the usual vacation roundup, they were shocked. They started saying I was jealous that their mom came back in their lives, that I'm a horrible person, I'm selfish, there was some name calling and my husband was silent. They hurled insults like daggers, each one finding its mark as they lashed out in their pain and confusion. I asked him if he was going to step in but his response was cold and indifferent, his words a knife twisted in the wound that was already bleeding. He said I was wrong for canceling. And so I stood alone, a solitary figure amidst the wreckage of our shattered dreams. For in that moment, I realized that I was fighting a battle that could not be won, a war of attrition that had already claimed its casualties. I left and went to stay in a hotel. I knew that I could no longer bear the burden of our fractured family alone. With a heavy heart and weary soul, I made a decision born of necessity, a choice to seek solace in the quiet refuge of a hotel room, far removed from the chaos that had consumed our once happy home. I needed time, time to heal the wounds that had been inflicted upon my soul, Time to find the strength to rebuild the shattered remnants of our fractured family. He has been blowing my phone up asking me to come back and yesterday he told me that their mother disappeared again. His voice, pleading and desperate, pierced the silence like a knife, its sharp edges cutting through the numbness that had settled over me like a shroud. He spoke of their tears, of their cries for forgiveness that fell upon deaf ears in my absence. They too have been calling me crying and apologizing. In their moment of desperation, they had turned to me, seeking redemption in the arms of the woman who had loved them unconditionally, despite the wounds they had inflicted upon her heart. But I don't want to do this anymore. I don't feel like I'm part of their family and they can't just cry and come back now that she disappeared. The love that had once bound us together as a family had been replaced by a sense of resignation, a recognition that our paths had diverged in ways we could never have anticipated. And so, with a heavy heart and tear-streaked cheeks, I spoke the words that would irrevocably alter the course of our lives. I want a divorce. I said, my voice barely above a whisper, as the weight of my decision settled like a stone in the pit of my stomach. I watched as my husband's expression shifted from shock to resignation, his eyes filled with a sadness that mirrored my own. And as I turned to leave, the silence of the empty room echoing in my ears, I knew that there was nothing left to say. In the stillness of the night, as the city outside my window lay shrouded in darkness, I found myself grappling with the weight of my own emotions, the turmoil of my thoughts threatening to overwhelm me. Yes, I knew their mother was manipulating them, twisting their fragile emotions like a pup tear pulling the strings of marionettes. I never said otherwise. But even with this knowledge, the sting of their betrayal cut deep, a wound that refused to heal no matter how hard I tried to ignore it. Yes, they are 16 years old, an age teetering on the precipice between childhood and adulthood. But even in their youth, they don't have the right to treat me this way. Being 16 doesn't mean you get to be disrespectful and threaten me. Despite the venom that dripped from their lips, I have always been in their corner. I had opened my heart to them, embracing them as my own flesh and blood, despite the absence of a biological connection. I know their feelings matter in this, but I am a person too with feelings that ran just as deep as theirs. And as I stood alone in the darkness, I realized that it was time to reclaim my own voice, to assert my own worth in a world that had seemed determined to diminish it. I am not only considering or moving forward with this divorce, the child acts only took a small part in my consideration. The rest are due to the fact that my husband did not back me up in this. I had always believed that marriage was a partnership, a sacred bond forged in love and mutual respect. But as I watched him stand idly by, his silence a damning indictment of his loyalty, I couldn't help but wonder if our union had been built on shaky ground from the start and that he had never loved me. The realization cuts deep. If I can't count on him to help me navigate this tough situation that we were all going through, then why should I stay? That does not mean that I should be treated the way I was being treated. That is not normal 16-year-old behavior. To threaten me? Call me vile names? I just need time for myself. And yet, even as I acknowledge my own flaws, I cannot shake the feeling of betrayal that lingers like a bitter taste upon my tongue. To be threatened and insulted by those whom I had loved and cared for as my own, it cuts me to the core, a wound that refuses to heal no matter how hard I try to ignore it. And I don't want an apology just because their bio mother ran out on them again. Yes, their mother's sudden disappearance had reignited old wounds, dredging up memories of past betrayals and broken promises. But even as I struggle to make sense of the chaos that surrounds me, I want an apology because they really mean it and I don't believe anyone can be truly sorry two days after their mother vanished again. I do not doubt the sincerity of their words, nor do I question the depth of their pain. 
But forgiveness cannot be rushed, nor can it be won through empty gestures and half-hearted apologies. I need more than words to heal the wounds that have been inflicted upon my soul, more than empty promises to mend the shattered remnants of our fractured family. I would never just abandon them. But I do need time for myself because my feelings were disregarded. But I am not selfish for needing time for myself, for acknowledging the depth of my own pain amidst the chaos that threatens to consume us all. Yes, I am an adult, but I am also human, with feelings that run just as deep as theirs. And in this moment of vulnerability, I realize that I cannot be the pillar of strength that they so desperately need not when my own foundation is so fragile and tenuous. As I sit in the dimly lit hotel room, the gentle hum of the air conditioner providing a soothing backdrop to the cacophony of thoughts that swirl within my mind, I find myself grappling with the complexities of human emotion. The events of the past few days weigh heavily on my heart, a burden too heavy to bear alone. I had never asked or expected them to be perfect, for I knew that imperfection was the very essence of humanity. But even in the midst of our flaws and shortcomings, there had always been love, a bond that transcended the trials and tribulations of everyday life. I had never expected them to be the most mature people, but I had hoped that they would at least understand the depth of my pain, the wounds that their words had inflicted upon my soul. They have feelings and so do I. I love them with a fierceness that defies reason. They are my children, my heart and soul woven into the fabric of their being, but this is a very complicated situation. This is not because they called me a bitch. Yes, they called me a bitch, but I have been called worse. I am a woman, strong and resilient in the face of adversity. This is ultimately about my husband not backing me up during this situation. And yes, I am hurt that they called me that I'm allowed to be. It hurts even worse coming from two people who I love dearly and would never hurt or want any harm to come to them. I had always believed that marriage was a partnership, a sacred vow to stand by each other through thick and thin. But as I watch him stand on the sidelines, his silence a painful reminder of his failure to stand up for me. I cannot help but feel a deep sense of betrayal. To all the step-parents navigating the often rocky terrain of blended families, I want to offer a few words of advice from my own perspective. I understand the challenges you face, the emotional roller coaster of loving someone who comes with their own children, and the hurdles you've likely overcome to earn acceptance in their lives. First and foremost, remember that building a family in a blended situation requires teamwork. You and your partner must be on the same page, communicating openly and honestly about your hopes, fears, and expectations. Without this solid foundation of mutual understanding and support, it's easy for resentment and discord to seep in, undermining all the efforts you've made to create a loving and harmonious home. Embrace the unique dynamics of your blended family. Every family is different, and what works for one may not work for another. Be flexible and adaptable, willing to adjust your expectations and approach as needed to accommodate the needs and preferences of all family members. The key is that you and your partner must work together to build a family. It's the only way for things to work out. Otherwise, all of your efforts and all the love you pour in will be useless. Hello, I have been getting a lot of messages asking for an update. I am now in a place to be able to give an update. You can look at my previous post for what this is about. I went back to the house two days ago. My husband and I had agreed to sit down and have a long overdue conversation about what had transpired, about the cracks that had begun to form in the foundation of our family. As we sat across from each other in the dimly lit living room, the memories of happier days lingered like ghosts in the corners of my mind. I couldn't help but cast my thoughts back to the countless afternoons spent together as a family, the sun-drenched days filled with laughter and love. But now, as I sat across from my husband, the gravity of our situation pressing down upon us like a leaden weight, I knew that we could no longer ignore the cracks that had begun to form in the foundation of our family. We had a long talk about what happened and how I didn't feel protected by him and how he knew how disrespectful they were being but didn't stop anything. As I sat across from my husband, the weight of his words settling like a leaden weight in the pit of my stomach, I couldn't help but feel a sense of disbelief wash over me. He said that he still loved his ex, and that's why pretty much. He spoke of his lingering feelings for his ex-wife, of the fear that had gripped him in the aftermath of her sudden return to their children's lives. He didn't want to do anything for her to leave them again, them as in him and the twins, but that didn't change how he felt about me. I listened in stunned silence, the air heavy with the weight of unspoken truths and unresolved emotions. How could he expect me to believe that his heart still belonged to another, even as he professed his love for me? It was a contradiction that left me reeling, a bitter taste of betrayal that lingered on my tongue. The reality of our situation crashing down around me like a tidal wave. I knew that the happy memories of our past could no longer sustain us. His admission of lingering feelings for his ex-wife was a wound that cut deep 
a betrayal that shattered the fragile illusion of our marriage. I told him that I've been there, not her, and how could he still love her, and it was very emotional and there was crying and yelling. I made the decision to move along with the divorce. I spoke to the twins, and they cried and said it's their fault, and to forgive them and their dad and not to leave. With a heavy heart and a voice thick with emotion, I explained to them that while I still loved them dearly, remaining with their father was not a path I could choose. I reassured them that I would always be there for them, that our bond would endure even in the face of adversity. But I also made it clear that their actions had consequences, that they could not treat people with such disrespect and expect everything to simply return to normal. I told them that as much as I loved them, staying with their dad and in this home was not an option, but I would still love to have a relationship with them if they want. But I am still very much hurt by what happened and would still appreciate a little more time for myself. I did move out and I was staying in a unit in one of my rental properties. Exciting news, I bought my first house. It was a fairly quick process. I'm excited for what's next. I bought my first house ever and next month I am taking a break from work for a few weeks or the whole month. Maybe two or three and doing some exploring of the world and healing and finding myself. I lost myself in the twins and my husband and didn't really focus on what I wanted and what made me happy. So I bought tickets again for Disney World. I have also made plans to go to Thailand next month and from there, I have no clue. I'm doing some spontaneous trips. I have always wanted to see the seven wonders of the world. Anyway, I am really happy to be getting a break. I told the kids I would love to have them over for dinner when I get settled into my new place. I do feel bad about canceling their trip to Disney, so I am thinking about funding a trip for them to go this summer for their 17th birthday. Just not with me. I'm excited to be traveling alone and I need the mental break. That is all really. My ex-husband and I divorced, but after a passionate night, I'm pregnant with our fourth child. Now we're stuck between staying co-parents or rekindling what we once had. My ex-husband and I were married for 10 years, although the last two were spent in variations of separation. We've been divorced for roughly a year. We have three kids, 10, 8, 5. I'm pregnant with our fourth baby. I don't know if we'll actually be parents to four kids or not. I'm so conflicted. We are so conflicted. There was no abuse or cheating in our marriage although he did sleep with somebody else during our separation. There are a variety of other reasons why we ultimately got divorced. After the initial feelings of failure and heartache, and there was an immense amount of heartache on my end despite being the one who filed for divorce, we were able to get along pretty well. It becomes platonic so quickly, and it's like when we remove the romantic and married relationship from the equation, things got so much better. We split time with our kids 50-50 this. That's really hard for me because being a mom is such a huge part of my identity that I still sometimes struggle to know what to do with myself during his time with the kids. Ultimately, I'm happy that he's a loving, involved father and I'm glad that they do spend half their time with him. Even if I still sometimes cry over not being with them all the time. We still do things together as a family sometimes. We sit together at our kids' activities, things like that. He has a girlfriend now. She seems nice. He met her not long after our divorce was finalized. It hurt. I cried way too much over it. He waited over six months to introduce her to our kids, which I was thankful for. My kids like her. Our youngest child was unexpectedly admitted to the hospital not long ago. He had surgery. In the grand scheme of things, it was a pretty minor surgery and he's absolutely fine now, but this is my baby and he had to spend multiple nights in the hospital. So this was a big deal for me. My ex-husband was there the entire time, being a great dad, being a supportive partner to me as I worried over every little thing. We spent all those nights in the hospital together and I remembered why I married him. He was always able to be the strong, level-headed rock for me. He was this safe person who I knew would take care of everything and protect me. When we were in the hospital, he told me that I'm the most important woman in his life. When our son was discharged, my ex-husband came back to my house. My baby was home safe. Our other two children were excited to be home after staying with my husband's sister for several nights. We were all together at home like a family again. That night, after our kids were in bed, we had sex. I hadn't been hoping for it or planning it. It was just like as soon as the kids were tucked away in their rooms, we were having this intensely passionate, needy, amazing sex that we shouldn't have been having. We went to sleep in my bed, and at some point in the middle of the night, we had sex again. The next morning, we both decided our emotions with the whole situation with our son just got the better of us. We said we didn't regret sleeping together, but that's all it was, and we were just going to go back to our normal divorce lives. We wouldn't make it awkward, just move on. Then I found out I was pregnant. We didn't use a condom. I don't even have condoms in my house anymore. I'm not on birth control. I haven't been since we divorced. I haven't needed it since I haven't had the time or interest to start dating again. 
I really wanted to be single for a while. I know I was ovulating when we slept together, which was probably a contributing subconscious factor as to why it happened. My body sees him being a good dad to our kids, and it wants another. My cycle is like clockwork, and we've always conceived on the first try every time we've tried to get pregnant. Our first kid was not even a try. It was two weeks before your wedding you find out you're pregnant and spend your honeymoon with morning sickness surprise. So now I'm about eight weeks pregnant. I've known for about a week. I just told him this past weekend. I didn't know if I would tell him at all. I realize now that I only told him in hopes that he'd tell me what to do and figure the situation out for me. Only he didn't. I know it makes no sense to have a baby with somebody I chose to divorce. I don't need a fourth child. Why can't I let go of this, though? Update 1. I posted about a week ago. My ex-husband and I have been divorced for about a year. We have three kids, ranging from 10, 5 years old. We have gotten along great since the divorce, better than when we were married. It's almost like we're friends, can do things with our kids, and enjoy being around each other. About two months ago, our youngest unexpectedly ended up having surgery and spending several nights in the hospital. He's fine now. My ex-husband and I stayed together with our son the entire time he was in the hospital. When he was discharged, my ex-husband came back to my house, or former family home, at our son's request. He was just supposed to spend a few hours there. Help our son get settled, then go home. However, I guess all of the emotions and being together as a family in our former shared home got the better of us, and we ended up having sex twice that night. Now I'm nine weeks pregnant. I wasn't on birth control, was on it until after our divorce was finalized but have been intentionally remaining single for a while and not involved with men in any way. So was giving my body a break from birth control. Initially, we were undecided about what to do, but as of last weekend, we made the decision together to have the baby. It feels sort of crazy to me. Definitely not a situation I ever imagined I'd find myself in. I already picture this baby looking just like our other kids. I guess that's why I struggled with the idea of not continuing with the pregnancy, which I know isn't really a valid reason to have a baby. This is probably the last baby I'll ever have. I'm 39, so even if I were to meet a man who I trusted enough to want to have a child with and a future with, I'll be well into my 40s by then. I plan to be very picky, but I'm not even at the point of wanting to find somebody new yet. We're not getting back together, for now. We get along great when we're not married and living in the same house. We feel it'd be irresponsible to all of our children to attempt to get back together right now because of this. Chances are higher that we'll be able to co-parent this baby successfully if we live separately. However, we are committed to working together to do what has to be done to take care of the baby when he or she gets here. Our kids are doing so great right now, and they seem very happy and secure with the current setup of our lives and homes, so we want to stick with this for now. I don't know if I really understand what I'm getting myself into. Our other kids were all born into a marriage and a two-parent home. I know that sharing custody of a baby will be a lot different than the kids going back and forth between homes. I'm might be feeling too positive about it, but I think it could work out fine. The new baby will just see this as normal, right? Next thing to worry about will be having to explain this to everyone when we tell them. My family and friends will get over it, but I'm especially concerned with explaining it to our kids. I'm worried our oldest won't take the news well. She also knows what sex is and how babies are made. And for everyone concerned about his girlfriend, she's not his girlfriend anymore. Top rated comment, these two are 100% getting back together within a year and then breaking up again in another. Update two, several people have asked me for an update on my situation. My ex-husband and I are having a baby. My other posts are on my profile. A recap is that we were married for 10 years, divorced for almost 1.5 years now, and have three kids together. We slept together twice during a stressful family time and I ended up pregnant. We've since admitted we are both still in love with each other, but have not actually declared that we're back together, mainly for the same of our kids. I last posted toward the end of January. I'm 28 weeks pregnant. We're having a little girl. As far as the pregnancy goes, it's been like a textbook pregnancy, and so I feel pretty good just more tired than I ever remember being during pregnancy before. My husband and I continue to live separately and share custody of our kids. We each have them 50% of the time. They're all aware that we're having a baby and none of them seem to be deeply confused or emotionally damaged by their divorced parents having a baby together. We explained it in an age-appropriate way. Our oldest child was more grossed out that her parents had sex than anything else since she now understands what sex is and how babies are made. We've been involved with her quite a bit and she's excited now. I even took her to one of my appointments. She's excited to have a baby sister and she understands that mom and dad love her and her siblings, that we love this new baby, and that we love each other as people and as parenting partners without actually being together as a married couple in one house. Meanwhile, my husband and I have started to attend couples counseling. We tried marriage counseling when we were separated before we divorced. 
but I think we were both already pretty mentally done so counseling didn't do much for us then. I think we're getting way more out of it now because we're actually invested in it and putting in a lot of effort. Sometimes I feel great after a session, and at other times I feel not so great and am reminded of reasons why we divorced. Overall, I think it's a good thing for us no matter what happens with our relationship. We've been sleeping together for the last few months. We already agreed that we won't be seeing other people at this time. I wouldn't be saying this while pregnant anyway and it's not as if I'll even have time with three kids and a newborn. We agreed that we will not open ourselves to being with other people while we are working on our relationship and before that conversation is had between us. We are carrying on just as we have been since our divorce, as far as our kids are concerned. Dad doesn't spend the night at our house. We do things together as a family sometimes, but we were doing that even before anything was rekindled between us. We're not acting as a couple when we're together as a family. We're friendly with each other, but there is no holding hands, kissing, etc. Our main concern is our kids. We refuse to say we're back together. If we officially get back together, we really want to feel certain that it'd be for the long term that we're ready to commit to that. We don't want to give our kids whiplash or do anything to make them insecure about our family. We would like to get to that point, but we aren't there yet. I think if my husband had his way, we'd be there. He's ready to say he's there now. He'd love to move back home, but he understands and agrees with my reasoning. I'd love for him to move back home too, based only on emotions. We both have things to work on, separately and together. I want to be a better spouse this time around. I thought I was being a really great wife and I was on the surface. I also know that right now I feel so in love and am hopped on on hormones and pregnancy happiness. I always feel super happy, super positive, and super horny during pregnancy. And I know I have to be careful with trusting anything I feel during this time, because it's like I'm on a 24-7's natural high. I think the biggest issue right now is that he's far more, let's throw caution to the wind, even though he agrees with all of my reasoning, and I want to be way more careful. Final update. I've made a few posts about my husband getting pregnant after we divorced. We were married for 10 years and had three kids before getting divorced. We got along so much better after we divorced, and we have been really good co-parents during this time, but we were functioning strictly as friendly co-parents. We slept together around one year after our divorce was finalized and conceived a fourth baby, which we ultimately decided to keep. Our fourth child, a sweet baby girl, was born at the end of May. She's so perfect, and we both feel we made the right choice to bring her into the world. It was the smoothest, easiest birth I've had, and I take that as a sign. I feel like I fell in love with him all over again during labor and delivery, and that's when I knew I was ready to make our relationship official and public to everyone, including our children. Contrary to all the assumptions, our kids really don't seem to be negatively affected or confused about the baby, and I don't think the newest baby is getting any less love or attention than our three kids born within our marriage had have. This is normal to them now. They understand we're still a family, and no matter what will always be a family whether mom and dad live together. We are still living separately and technically still maintaining the custody schedule we had in place for our oldest three kids. Although the kids are with me every weekday right now since it's summer break and I'm on maternity leave, we have a different arrangement for the baby, but he does take her overnight a few nights a week. I got our family home and the divorce, and he spends time here with all of us. He has spent some nights here at home to help with the baby, but he doesn't stay in my bedroom quite yet. He has not moved in, although he has tried and continues to suggest it. This is probably the biggest point of contention these days. To me, this feels like the best of both worlds. I love him and truly don't want to be with anyone else. I think I sort of function better and am happier also living in my own space that he just visits. I know it's not the norm, and some might say this means I don't really love him as much as I think. I really believe I'm just one of those people who needs more independence and alone time. And maybe we never would have got divorced in the first place if this had been the arrangement from the beginning. Is it sort of selfish? Maybe I don't know anyone else with this arrangement, but I know some people out there do this. For all intents and purposes, we are together in a relationship again. We've made it official and exclusive, as juvenile as that sounds. We had already made it official between ourselves, but we hadn't really announced it to family and friends or our kids. We are still in love with each other or back in love with each other, and we are not seeing anyone else. Our kids have adjusted well. They've been seeing a therapist since we filed for a divorce, so that has really helped us navigate some of this. Prior to the baby's birth, we did not tell them that we were essentially in a relationship. Only so long you can keep that a secret from your kids. Even though they're young, they're perceptive. So we've recently explained to them that mommy and daddy love each other, but we get along better living in separate homes and, for now, we think this is the best thing for our family. The only problem is that now they keep asking about when we will all live together again. I'm sure it's a little confusing to them, 
but I'm not sure how we could be handling it any better. We attempted marriage counseling when we separated before divorce. It was not successful. I don't think either of us was 100% committed to it at the time. He really did not take it seriously back then, but I was more stubborn and resistant than I originally realized. We're in couples therapy now, and it's like night and day compared to last time. I'm scared to live together again, so we aren't going to do that anytime soon. It's not that I don't trust him. I don't trust us as a couple. I refuse to put my kids through all of that again. So, getting remarried and moving in together isn't something in the plans right now. Maybe one day. I hope we can get to that point. I just don't want my kids to have to go through a divorce and splitting households yet again. I feel like they'd lose all trust in us then. OP on their living situation. I think it might be best for us to find a way to each have our own place next to each other or on the same property instead of one actual house that we share. Other than not living together, we are together. It's no different than any other couple that's dating but doesn't live together. Well, it's a little different since we share kids and we were once married and I still usually refer to him as my husband, but not too different. We aren't keeping our relationship a secret anymore, so we aren't pretending to not be together. Everyone knows now. We spend a lot of time together. But yeah, he may eventually want more than I do, as in a relationship where we live together 24 sevens. At this point, the hubby's ex Keith was firmly in the rearview mirror and OP was still brushing it off as if it is no biggie. But I found one exchange that people may find interesting. OP downvoted. Yes, he had a girlfriend at the time. It's in my post history and I'm not trying to hide it, but we have moved well beyond that now. Response people are downvoting her comment because it is pretty black and white when it comes to cheating. Cheating hurts others and a lot of people value living in a world and having actions that don't result in hurting others. He was in a relationship and committed to his girlfriend when he decided that he had the right to sleep with his ex and not immediately tell her that he did it. She deserved better than to get trauma from someone who claimed to be committed to her but was willing to step out on her. Cheating on someone does result in emotional trauma, which will affect how they will view love and relationships going forward. Personally, if he wasn't ready to be in a relationship with her, then he should have left her alone. I am tired of men in particular getting into relationships with women when they know they are not clearly over their ex-partner. It is a sign of selfishness and pure disregard of another human being's health. She was used as an emotional support and sex object by him because no one that respects their partner would do something this cruel. So I'm not going to cheer on someone who could have just avoided this entire situation by not being in a relationship when he was clearly not ready to be in one and hurt someone deeply. Edit. I want to add additional thought as well. Cheating is not only an emotional hurt, but a sign that you give zero care about your partner's health. He was presumably still having sex with his ex-girlfriend after sleeping with no condoms with his ex-wife, with the rate of sexually transmitted diseases and infections increasing and the likelihood of the disease being antibiotic resistant, he told his ex that he had zero care for health and emotional well-being. She had the basic right to know that he slept with another person while still being intimate with her, especially with no form of protection, not calling the ex-wife dirty but with the risk of catching a disease that's incurable or opens you up to higher risk of illness. Every person who is engaging in a sexual relationship deserves honesty. OP. All of this may be true. I'm not arguing anything you said, but I'd like to know what everyone on Reddit thinks we're, we're supposed to do about it. We can't go back in time and undo what we did. Maybe Redditors feel that as an act of penance we should not be together, despite very much wanting to, since that's what we deserve for hurting her in her process. We should never be allowed to move on and have any happiness in our lives, together or separate because we did something at one time that hurt somebody, short of publicly flogging ourselves and maybe not allowing ourselves to ever be in a relationship with anyone ever again as a form of self-punishment. What are we supposed to do to satisfy the masses? Neither of us are proud of hurting somebody. Thank you for watching. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do so and hit the notification bell to stay updated with more shocking real-life stories happening around you. My husband secretly shared intimate videos of me online. Now, I'm fighting for justice while he faces prison. Last Friday, I, 34F, spent my evening with my friend obligatory fake name, Katie, 24F from work, as she wanted to discuss something personal with me. I didn't think anything of it, as we have a very personal relationship outside of work as well. As soon as I arrived at her place, the tension in the air was thick. She explained that she wanted to discuss a serious matter with me, but didn't know how to go about it. I told her to just rip the band-aid off and tell me. She told me that she had found two recordings of a woman she believed to be me on a pornographic website. I told her that wouldn't be possible, but she was adamant that I was the woman in the recordings. And she was right. 
I've never recorded myself naked or having sex with my husband, but there I was in two recordings, one seven minutes long, and the other four minutes both of them recorded in our old bedroom. As I rewatched every second of it, it started to dawn on me that this was my husband's doing. But I pushed that deep down, thinking there must be a reasonable explanation for this. Honestly, I left her place with my mind in complete meltdown. I could barely hear what she was saying, but she did follow up with a text saying she had contacted the website about getting it taken down and that she would help me through this. She also said she was scaring the internet in case there were more videos out there. I came home and pretty much ransacked my house looking for evidence, and I found it. My husband was using hidden spy cameras to record me in my most intimate moments. I then spent hours vomiting, crying, projectile vomiting some more, and begging God to just let this be a nightmare. I am a deeply religious and fully veiled Muslim woman, and I've never been with anyone but my husband. All this time, he has been sharing my most intimate moments with the world. I don't know what to think or what to do. I can't look at him or speak to him. I've locked myself in our bedroom, pretending I have COVID. All I do is look up how other people have dealt with getting things removed, and it seems like once it's on the internet, it really is forever. Even if I remove it from this one website, I've been crying nonstop. He truly must be something demonic, as he is right now talking about ordering some of my favorite foods to see if I have an appetite since I have an epidol. I am so unbelievably hurt. I don't know how to share this with my family or how to ask for help. I am crippled with shame, anger, and pain. Answering some questions, my husband soon to be ex-husband and I are of the same religion, ethnicity, and nationality. My family would support me in divorcing him, in fact, they would demand I do so. The laws in my country are secular, but in certain circumstances, they allow for various religious groups to hold their own courts that can enforce rulings. As long as it doesn't impose on or break secular law or civil liberties, I do plan on taking this to both secular court and religious court as I want him punished. I veil by choice, and the vast majority of my fellow countrywomen do not veil. Katie and I do not share the same religion or dress alike, yet we are friends, call it a surprise. Update, I left him as I said I would. He went to work. The movers arrived, we packed my stuff, and we left. The entire time, I was crying to the point that even the movers felt bad for me. I went home, sat my parents and siblings down, and explained the situation. My parents were and still are confused. They are elderly and fragile and don't understand the internet. They just keep saying, okay, let's talk to the people, and it will be gone but my siblings understand. They are angry, sad, and heartbroken on my behalf. My siblings and brother-in-laws took me home and we waited for him. Well, we had a conversation with him. He denied everything at first, but my brothers were firm with him and he started to be more truthful. He said he did it because he was depressed, had a porn addiction, and didn't think anyone would see it. He said he posted only a few videos. When we asked him to be specific, he said he posted anywhere from five to eight. We had him take them down, but who knows how many times they had been downloaded or shared. In that moment, I also found out he had a secret phone and had been cheating on me with random women and sex workers. All this time, I thought he was working hard, but nope, he was out disgracing himself and betraying our marriage. At some point, he convinced us he needed to use the bathroom and he somehow managed to call his mother. She arrived at our home with his brother and cousins. There was a commotion as they were angry at the treatment of their family member. Things calmed down enough to explain to them what he had done. His mother fainted. She is elderly and not in the greatest health condition. We called for an ambulance. My neighbor had also called the police, and I was arrested by the time the ambulance arrived to take care of my mother-in-law. I spent the evening locked up. I hadn't exactly had a polite conversation with him. So, yes, I was arrested for assaulting him, specifically slapping him, and he refused to press charges. I got released the next morning and went home to my parents. I cried some more because my parents kept crying. A few days later, I spoke to some lawyers my sister had contacted, as they had experience with non-consensual material being posted online. They have been handling things with the police, as I did press charges, and they are dealing with the websites. I have also started the process of divorce. I went to the clinic and got tested, and luckily, he didn't give me anything so far. But I have another test scheduled just to make sure. I have spoken to his mother, and she apologized to me even though it's not her fault. She told me she understood why I wanted him punished. She asked that I let the law handle it rather than take matters into my own hands or have him hurt. He's in hiding, but he still calls and texts me from random numbers. He still lies and tries to manipulate me. I've just been documenting everything he says and texts. Oh, at this point, everyone knows. I mean, everyone, even little kids. And I feel more humiliated now than I did at first. Final you date. This man has destroyed everything I worked for, completely eroding the little stability and safety I had left. I had to resign from my job, a position I loved and struggled to obtain due to my appearance. The harassment from men, both at work and in public, became unbearable. Some fathers at work even made lewd comments or inappropriate offers, and one even followed me from the dentist and groped me. My husband posted all my personal information online, including my address and contact details, 
leaving me vulnerable to harassment. Though many people have supported me, former colleagues, neighbors, and even members of my religious community, the voices of perverts and crazies have been louder. Then, my lawyers and investigators uncovered that my husband was drugging me, using my own medication to assault me as I slept. He even bragged about it on online forums with other predators. My soon-to-be ex-husband spread lies, claiming I knew about the cameras and even pressured him into posting the videos, and some people believed him. He also changed his mind about not pressing charges for when I slapped him. Thankfully, the judge and prosecutors saw through his lies, dismissing the case after my lawyers presented evidence that he only pressed charges to cause me harm. But his crimes are still under investigation. I'm not feeling better. He continues to be as cruel as possible, dragging out the divorce by running off his lawyers and delaying every step of the process. The courts granted him extensions because his lawyers dropped him, and it feels like we're constantly starting from scratch. His trial for posting non-consensual material has also been delayed due to his lawyer quitting. On top of all this, my father passed away, and my mother is now in hospice care. At my father's funeral, my husband cornered me while I was alone, trying to apologize and blame me for everything. He admitted that he had always been jealous of me, of my success, and of the fact that I didn't let him control me. He claimed that he turned to addiction because he felt inadequate and wanted to punish me for not conforming to his idea of a submissive wife. He excused his actions, saying he posted the videos out of anger and got addicted to the validation from men online. He even asked for credit for seeking help for his addictions and felt I should take him back. I listened in silence for three hours as he made excuse after excuse, blaming me for his actions. But his honesty meant nothing. I finished cleaning up, got in my car, and went home. I'm still struggling. I've lost a lot of weight and hair due to the stress, and I'm not working. However, several websites have removed the videos and banned him from their platforms, which is one small win. I also obtained a restraining order, and after multiple incidents of him stalking and harassing me, he was finally imprisoned. He's been in prison for over a month now, and I've been granted my divorce. Initially, I wanted to give him everything he asked for, but after his endless delays, I told my lawyers to go all in. They did, and I got everything I wanted and more. This has been the most peaceful month I've had in a long time. Watching him cry in court was oddly satisfying after everything he put me through. I've moved across the country, found a new job, and am slowly rebuilding my confidence. I'm in therapy, and while it's not working just yet, I know it will help in time. Although I've been compensated for the non-consensual material, I'm not delusional. I know that it's still out there somewhere, and there's little I can do to change that. I'm trying to make peace with it. As for my ex-husband, he's facing up to 30 years in prison, and I've heard he attempted suicide and is now in protective custody. He will face the consequences of his actions, and I'm looking forward to it. I slept with my sister's husband, and now she won't speak to me I want to apologize, but everyone thinks I'm the villain. I, 29F, find myself in a complicated and difficult situation that has strained my relationship with my sister, 31F. I recently slept with her husband and now she refuses to speak to me. However, I genuinely believe that I am not solely to blame for the fallout, and I need an impartial judgment on whether I am the asshole in this scenario. Prior to the incident, I noticed some questionable behavior from my brother-in-law, 33M, towards me. Feeling concerned about my sister's well-being, I decided to address the issue with her. However, she dismissed my concerns, leaving me unsure of how to proceed. My sister works as a flight attendant and is gone more than she is at home. My brother-in-law recently lost his job and was feeling depressed. During one of her frequent absences from home, she asked me to keep her husband company. She trusted me and didn't believe the warnings I gave her before about his behavior towards me. But I saw this as an opportunity to support their marriage and help them rebuild their connection. Unfortunately, as we spent more time together, our bond deepened, and we eventually crossed a line that should never have been crossed. We had both been drinking, and he was complaining to me about the troubles in their marriage and how he hasn't been happy for a while. He was crying, and I decided to comfort him. One thing led to another, and we did the unthinkable. I woke up realizing the nature of what I did and immediately regretted it. We were both so intoxicated that we stupidly ended up falling asleep. I awoke to my sister screaming and hitting the both of us, shouting, How could you do this to me? We're sisters. I trusted you she wouldn't even give me a chance to explain and kicked me out of the house. Now, my sister refuses to speak to me. She has filed for divorce. Our parents are siding with her, saying that I violated every family moral. However, I believe that there are multiple factors at play here, and I am not the only one responsible for the breakdown of their marriage, while I acknowledge my mistake. I also question why my sister failed to address the issues in her relationship and why she left her husband in my care without setting clear boundaries. I do feel a sense of guilt and remorse for my actions but I also recognize that my sister and her husband had their fair share of problems. It's unfair to place all the blame on me when there were underlying issues that existed long before our involvement. That being said, I understand my sister's anger and hurt. I am willing to accept responsibility for my actions and make amends, but I also believe that it is crucial for her to acknowledge her role in this situation. Rebuilding trust and repairing our relationship will require open and honest communication from both parties. In sharing my story, I hope for an unbiased judgment and guidance on how to navigate this difficult situation. Update 1. 
Okay, guys, I get it. You've ripped me apart in the comments, and yeah, I admit I messed up. After deeply reflecting on my actions and seeking advice from others, I have come to realize the extent of the hurt and damage I caused my sister. I genuinely regret my behavior and am now fully aware that I was in the wrong. There's no excuse for what I did, and I think I was trying to excuse my actions because the thought of it all was too painful. Last night, after reading the comments, I mustered up the courage to reach out and apologize to my sister. Unfortunately, despite my sincere efforts, she has not only refused to speak to me but has also blocked me from all forms of communication. The fact that my sister has taken such measures is deeply upsetting to me. I yearn for her forgiveness and genuinely want her back in my life. However, I understand that I cannot force her to reconcile or forgive me on my terms. I have sought advice from friends and family on how to navigate this situation. But it seems like the best course of action for now is to respect her boundaries and give her the space she clearly needs. I have continued to reflect on my actions and have sought therapy to address the underlying issues that led to my hurtful behavior. I found some online therapy options and plan on calling soon to get started to help figure out the root of my behavior. I am committed to personal growth and becoming a better person, regardless of whether or not my sister chooses to reconnect with me. I will never give up trying. I have also reached out to mutual friends and family members, hoping they might act as intermediaries or offer support in bridging the gap between us. However, I understand that they, too, must respect my sister's boundaries and not get involved in our personal dispute. My ex-brother-in-law has refused to pick up any of my phone calls through all of this. I heard from my mother that he told her I initiated the entire thing, got him drunk and then forced myself onto him, which is the furthest thing from the truth. I can't believe he'd throw me under the bus after I was there for him for so long. Guess I really looked like the fool, huh? The pain of not being able to communicate with my sister is devastating, but I am determined to learn from my mistakes and make amends in any way possible. I will continue to work on myself and strive to become someone who deserves her forgiveness, even if it takes a significant amount of time. To say the past few months have been insane is an understatement. I feel like my entire world has caved in. While I hold on to hope that one day my sister will be willing to reopen the lines of communication, I also acknowledge the possibility that she may never want to speak to me again. Regardless, I will continue to grow, learn, and reflect on my actions, knowing that healing and reconciliation are processes that cannot be rushed or forced. I hope my sister sees my remorse and my effort to grow. I will update if anything further happens. Some interesting comments. Medical Caller 2678 says, Your logic is that their relationship was already failing, so your sister should take responsibility. Let me ask you a question using your own logic. Let's say your car is older and needs some work done. If I come up and steal your car, GTA style, and total it, would you be at fault for the crash because the car was already failing? Or would it be me because I'm the one that took it and couldn't control the car and crashed? See how dumb that sounds. If it was failing, then your job was to help your sister get through this and guide her towards counseling or divorce. Instead, you guided your way into his pants. I think there's more to the story, and the more to the story is you had feelings for your brother-in-law for a while, and this drunk behavior made you act on it. You give off golden child energy in which you've rarely been held accountable. Oh, and if my comment wasn't clear enough, you're the asshole. Comforio says, this has to be a troll post, rage bait. OP reply, how am I baiting? Do you need to see screenshots between my sister and me? I feel bad, yes. My point is I shouldn't be completely at fault here. I'm not trying to be a victim. Screenshots of a text conversation with OP's sister, Lindsay, I am extremely sorry. I haven't been able to eat, sleep, or function since this has all happened. Regardless of you believing it's been ongoing, it only happened once. I take full responsibility for my part. I should have distanced myself from him when he was making advances before. I should have pressed it more. I shouldn't have given in. I was intoxicated. I wouldn't have done it sober. I take responsibility for it. I just feel that responsibility needs to be taken that it was already failing. You should have left him a long time ago or even believed me when I tried to tell you. Sisters reply, are you kidding me? You're always the victim, Kelly. Always. You can never take responsibility for your actions. I swear you could hit someone with a car walking on a damn sidewalk and you'd still argue it was their fault too for not moving. You betrayed me. You're right. I stupidly didn't believe you because I was in denial about my marriage but I never thought that you would do this to me ever. I helped raise you. I was there for you whenever you needed me. I forgave you for the upbringing we had with you always being the favorite. You cannot handle the fact that mom and dad are siding with me for once. I never want to see you again. You are no longer my sister. OP's response, I am sorry. I never meant to hurt you. I am not trying to play the victim at all. I take responsibility. But why am I getting the most heat here? He's just as at fault. All I am saying is that you should have left him or been actively trying to fix the relationship or it wouldn't have gotten this far. But that still does not excuse my behavior. I am the worst. I just don't understand why I get the most heat. Sister's final response, because you are my sister, men come and go. I am not going back and forth. I have a good life being the bitch that you are. Final update, while you guys are ruthless, I fully see that I was in the wrong 
and my behavior is inexcusable. I do not deserve to have her as a sister, and I am literally a piece of crap. There's not a single insult you guys can give me that I haven't given myself. Surprisingly, my sister unblocked me, expressing her desire for closure and personal healing. It seems that she has reached a point where she needs to address the past in order to move forward, but she has made it clear that she doesn't wish to continue our relationship. We had an open and honest discussion about the pain and hurt that had accumulated over time. It was an emotional and challenging conversation, but one that allowed us to express our feelings and seek some form of closure. During our conversation, my sister made it clear that she has made the difficult decision to no longer have a relationship with me. She explained that she needs to focus on her own healing and well-being and believes that maintaining a relationship with me would hinder that process. It was a heartbreaking realization for me to accept but I understand and respect her choice. In our conversation, I took the opportunity to sincerely apologize for any pain I have caused her. I acknowledged my past mistakes and expressed deep regret for my actions. While I had hoped for a different outcome, I understand that my sister's healing journey is her own to navigate, and it may not involve me. Moving forward, I will continue to reflect on the lessons learned from this experience. I have come to understand the impact of my actions and the importance of personal growth and self-reflection. It is crucial for me to learn from this and strive to become a better person, even if it means accepting that my sister wants no further relationship with me. While it is painful to accept the loss of a close bond, I will honor my sister's wishes and give her the space she needs to heal and move forward. I will continue to work on myself, seeking personal growth and understanding, and ensuring that I do not repeat the mistakes of the past. This experience has taught me the importance of empathy, forgiveness, and respecting the boundaries of others. I am grateful for the opportunity to have had this conversation with my sister, as it has allowed me to gain a deeper understanding of the consequences of my actions and the importance of growth and healing in relationships. This will likely be my last update, as there's nothing more to say. I lost my sister and the respect of the people closest to me, but through all of that, she is the victim, not me. I deserve this.